That's kind of a stretch for me. Anybody else going to go there? Maybe tomorrow? I'd like to. I know Pastor David has been a missionary in the Middle East. My family has been to Peru a few times. But it's a little rough, isn't it? But God, in his amazing grace and his amazing plans, has provided us with an opportunity. Aubrey's holding it in her, hand, in her hands right now. These shoe boxes are more than just a box full of toys and gifts. This is the gospel right here. This is how we reach children for Jesus right here through Samaritan's Purse. Before these boxes are distributed, families and friends in the community are invited to a worship service, and local Christians are trained to present the gospel. And many children at that time come to Christ. Then they are given a shoebox gift. This is a tangible way to present Jesus to a child. One thing to remember is many of these children have never received a gift before. Can you imagine being a teenager and never having received a gift ever? So that's pretty cool, isn't it? And then after the shoebox is distributed, they're invited to attend to a 12-week vacation Bible school type class that's called The Greatest Journey, where they learn discipleship. So not only is it a gospel lesson, it's discipleship and then multiplication because they take that lesson home to their family and community. So how cool is God's plan through these shoe boxes, right? Now last year in our community, God did an amazing thing. He provided us with about 150 extra shoe boxes. Remember Pastor David? <laughs> it was amazing. So we talked about it and we said, we can put them in a closet for next year, or we can say, why don't we get these shoe boxes out to these children? So we asked for your help. And this congregation stepped up and said, yeah, we're going to do this. And we did it. And our church doubled the shoe boxes last year. So God did an amazing work here. And yes, yes, he did. In fact, Jackson County last year doubled the shoe boxes, doubled the gospel opportunities. We reached that many more children. I'd like to see us do that again this year. You think we can? You think God can do it? I sure do. I think he can. So I'm going to share a couple brief shoe box stories with you. There was a child in Tanzania. He was a teenager. He'd never had any shoes. And he was made fun of constantly at school. And he was trying to figure out if he could steal money to buy shoes or how he could get those shoes. He was invited to an Operation Christmas Child outreach. What do you think was in that box? In his size. Only God can do that. And I had a training video this last Thursday for the shoebox program. And Franklin Graham was in that training video. He was in a bombed out church in Mosul, which is in northern Iraq. It was debris and rubble everywhere. And underneath that rubble, what do you think he found? A shoebox. So God is working through these shoeboxes. God is working through you. He's given us a command. And I know I owe a big debt to my God, who is big and who has plans. So I am so thankful to be in this community and this church and watch him work. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> so can we pray? Okay. Father God, I'm so thankful for you and your sovereignty and your plans because they're so much bigger than me and my plans. And I'm thankful for your commandments, Lord. And I'm thankful that not only do you command us as believers to follow your footsteps and get your gospel out there, Lord, but that you give us a way to do it and a way that we can handle 
in our own finite minds. And Lord Jesus, I pray for every single person who steps up to the plate and helps us get these shoe boxes out. Lord, I pray, I pray that they be blessed. I pray for the volunteers who present the gospel to these children. And Lord, I pray for these children that are going to receive these boxes. I pray for their hearts be softened to accept Jesus. And I pray for the ministry that will follow through this program. In Jesus' name, I pray. And all God's people said... Amen. All right, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask me or Pastor David. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Cindy. That was a powerful, powerful testimony. Um, I want to move now to a, a time for uh, prior requests and got, got a few down here. Terry Smith, uh, who is Tony Smith's uh, brother. That'd be uh, Roger Williams' uh, son-in-law, Tony, that being. Uh, he had a, a leg removed. I think he's got um, maybe sugar and, and things like that. So he's had another leg removed. Uh, so remember the Smith family. Um, Want to continue remembering her lost. Um, any other prayer requests in the church that needs to be mentioned? Remember Jared, Jared Allen. Any others? A few announcements. Uh, Leah McQueen, she was engaged recently to Logan Gabbard. So I don't, I don't see any of the, the McQueens here today, but, but Leah got engaged. Um, birthdays, anniversaries, Becky Holcomb, Jerry Bond, and Miss Rihanna. Uh, who's in a tennis day, er, birthdays today, is that right? Good deal. How old are you, Rihanna? How old are you? I can't hear you. <laughs> officially, a officially a teenager. Well, good deal. Well, very happy birthday to you. I don't think we have any any singers up here, so we won't we won't sing happy birthday. Nah. No. Uh, do we have a do we have a chorus back here? We have That's awful good. I have to say that was awful good. It sure was. Uh if you wouldn't mind, Brother Philip Allen, I'm gonna ask you to Lead us in prayer.
Brother Greg is not here today, so we're grateful to have Daryl and Joyce helping to lead us. And, of course, Teresa is always playing. Let's give them some encouragement as they come up. Nothing but the blood, page 197.
Thank you all again for leading us. Anybody have a special song, special number they want to sing this morning? Okay. We'll turn our attention to God's Word. Today's message is titled uh, Kingdom Giving. And as far as I know, I think this may be the first message I've ever preached on giving here at Amble Baptist. Maybe my first message on giving ever. Just the way that, that God's Word is kind of lined up. And, and you all know I like to preach through books. And so we just take whatever God leads us to and, and be faithful to it. Because again, it's all God's Word. It's all inspired and, and uf, useful and beneficial for our daily lives. So today's message, Kingdom Giving. And, and what we're going to do today is a little bit different. And I, I've done this some in the past but, but my preference is to just take a, a passage and to just drill down deep into it and focus on that. But today, we're really going to cover a larger portion of Scripture and do more of kind of a zoom out, kind of a bird's eye view and, and talk about a particular passage that I think we're all probably aware of. But I had never really seen it until this past week as I studied in context that it may not be as much about what we thought it was about. And that's the story of the widow, the, what we talk about the widow's might. Or mites, technically, because she, she drops two. We talk, you know, with the story of the woman who, who places two little pennies in. We'll get to that story. But again, I think we're going to see in the context, it's a little bit different than, than what we might have originally thought. So let's just talk context. Before we get to God's Word, before I start reading for us, let's talk context. Where are we at in the Gospel of Mark? We're, we're nearing the end, although we're... Uh, getting ready to finish chapter 12 today, and there's 16 chapters, so what is that? 13, 14, 15, 16, four more chapters left, but really getting towards the end of Jesus' life. And, and a good portion of Mark's gospel is just focused on his last week. And why is that? Because the last week of Jesus' life is the most important. Amen? Because you got the death and resurrection. And, and those two things, and we talk about the gospel a lot. There's no gospel without Jesus' death and resurrection. But what's leading up to that? He's on the donkey, he rides in, they're waving the palm fronds, they say, Hosanna. He gets there the very next day, he goes into the temple, he cleanses it, he brings judgment, and already the religious leaders, they didn't like him. They were jealous. The crowds gathered around him, and so they were determined to get rid of Jesus, especially when he goes in and cleanses the temple. They're like, that's it, can't handle anymore, we've got to get rid of him. So they send the best of the best of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they all try to catch Jesus in his words, try, trying to execute him. So there's this escalation. And really, I think today's passage and even the story of the widow's might is, is a part of the climax of this particular passage. And you'll see what I'm talking about when, when we get to that. So all this conflict, all this resistance, and Jesus has, has proven the religious leaders to be hypocrites, and to not know God's word very well, even though they were supposed to be the specialist of, of God's word. So we're going to start here in, in Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 35. I'm not going to read the whole passage because we're going all the way through chapter 13, verse 2. But I just want to read three verses for us. And I want to ask everybody, if you would, stand with me for the reading of God's word. And... And Cliff or Tetch back there, can somebody turn on this back uh, TV on for me? I'd, I'd appreciate that. That'll help me out. So starting verse 35 through 37, we're just going to read these three. That'll give us a chance to stretch. And then the rest of it I'll just take as we come to it in, in the passage. So here's the word of the Lord, verse 35. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth himself, himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you speak to us this morning through your word. May it be you, not me speaking. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. 
this first section that we that we that I just read, we're going to read other verses, but it really sets up what's coming on, what's coming on, or what's coming up next, and what's going to be in the verses that follow. Because remember, tension, tension with all the religious leaders. It's coming, and then finally, Jesus stops here, and he 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 starts to talk about the Messiah. And we've talked about as we've moved through the Gospel of Mark from the very first words of. The Gospel of Mark, we see that Jesus is the Messiah. Mark, Mark wants his, his readers to be very clear on that. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, or the Christ, which literally means the Anointed One. The one that the Jews had looked forward to, anticipated that He would come and overthrow the, the Romans. And He would come and He would establish the Kingdom of God. And so Jesus, in the middle of all this confrontation... He goes to the Old Testament, goes to a passage here, but he starts talking about the Messiah and who he truly is. And in, the, in these few verses, we don't have time to, to, to just go verse by verse because I want to just kind of move through and get, get on with, with some of these other verses. Jesus affirms that he's the Messiah, not only all through God, Mark's gospel, but right here especially as well. But something that he reveals in this passage that's important regarding the Messiah is that the Messiah was not just going to be a man, he was going to be a God-man. He was going to be both divine and both human. And you may say, well, where's that at in the Old Testament? Jesus takes him to the Old Testament, and first he says, the Messiah is David's son, therefore he is human. He's David's son. He's in the line of David. We see that. You see kind of the logic there. But then he says, also... The Messiah, based on this passage here that David writes in the Old Testament, he also says the Messiah is David's Lord. And what, what, is it, what are you saying about that? He's saying, therefore, if he's David's Lord, he is divine. This is what Jesus pointed out. He said, not only am I the Messiah, but the, the Messiah is going to be a God-man. He's going to be human, and he's going to be divine. Now, the rest of this passage, what I want to look at today is, is I want to try to answer this question. If Jesus is the Messiah, and the Messiah is the God-man, perfectly, perfectly human, perfectly God, how does one, how do we live based on that truth? If we believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was perfectly human, but also perfectly divine, how should we live our lives? And the first thing that we're going to see here in the next few verses is we're going to see a negative example. Because Jesus is going to show us what it looks like to not live as if Jesus is the Messiah. And what's he going to do? He's going to go to the scribes. Man, they're all, they've been challenging him and he's been calling out their hypocrisy and their lack of understanding. And, and look what he says in verse 38 because he's going to call them out. This is a negative example. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't believe in his divinity and his humanity. Verse 38 and Jesus said unto them in his doctrine or in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who love to go in long clothing. Quick translation, they love the flowing robes, the, the rich, expensive clothing. Because they wanted to be seen, you'll see as we move through this. And love salutations or greetings in the marketplaces. They love to be known. To be seen, to be greeted. They loved popularity. I think if we had scribes today, they would probably be counting how many Twitter followers they have or Instagram followers, right? I mean, they love the popularity to be seen, to be noticed. Verse 39. And the chief seats, they love the chief seats in the synagogues, the most important, the most powerful places, the most prominent, and the uppermost rooms at feasts. And they wanted the best seats. They wanted the seats of honor. Now this, this is the, that was their focus. Verse 40. And said, but, but they devour widows' houses. They had no concern, no love, no compassion for the oppressed, for the outcast, for those, that could, those who could not help themselves, the vulnerable. They did not care about them. And it says, and a pretense to make long prayers. They love to be seen, and they love to be heard. And, and what does Jesus say here at the very end? These or those individuals will receive greater damnation, judgment. There's judgment on these individuals, on these scribes. 
So let me sum up all that for you. If you're going to say, David, how would you sum up the scribes? Here's what I would say. Is they live for themselves and not for others. They live for themselves and not for, definitely not for God, not for others. Because remember last week, what's the two greatest commandments? Love God, love others, love people. And, and I hope you hear me say that over and over again. And I pray that we would never forget that. That's part of our mission. Love God, love people, live on mission. That's what God has called us to. But they live for themselves and not for others. They live for the here and now. Because they live for themselves, they live for the here and now rather than the future. Now that's so important for us to think about. They live for the here and now, not the future. What does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, store up treasures in heaven, not on earth. All right? don't, don't store up treasures here on earth. They were raw, raw, uh, rust, <laughs> rust and moth. You know what rust and moth together is wroth. I guess that's where that came from. Rust and moth, they destroy. But, but you know if you store up treasures in heaven, they're not going to be destroyed, Jesus says. They didn't care... And because they focused on themselves and they live for the here and now, they didn't care who they harmed, they didn't care what they did, who they pushed down, who they kicked down, who they, who they uh, just ignored or forgot. As long as they got their way. Because look at what he says back here in verse 40. They devoured widows' houses. And in those days, it's not as much today, we've talked about this before, but in those days, a widow really had no means... To, to provide for for themselves. Now, today we have certain systems in place, retirement and Social Security and, and things like that and family structures. But in those days, widows, they, they didn't have much. And they needed, they relied on the help of others. And, but instead of helping them, what are these guys doing? Man, they're taking their homes. Taking, you know, they would make a pledge and eventually they knew the widows couldn't pay back and so then they would just take it. Now, let me just stop here and say this. And kids, you can ask, if you, kids, if you've been listening to me, I want you to answer this question. Any of you like to be friends with a scribe that's always talking about themselves, wanting to be the center of attention, doesn't care about others? Anybody want to be friends with them? No. No. Now, sometimes we, we like to watch movies and shows about people like that, but we don't like to be friends with them. And you know what? God wasn't happy with them either. They weren't friends with God, so to speak. And God speaks about the, the, the judgment that, that was going to be on them, that was on them. And here's the thing. In those days, and, and we sometimes confuse this today as well. This is important. Sometimes we, uh, we view money and wealth and power and prestige as divine favor from God. Right? You can read some of that through the Old Testament but even today, there's this idea that, you know what, if somebody's rich, man, God's really happy with them. They're, he, they're really pleased. But look at what Jesus says here. These scribes who had the wealth, who had the influence, who had the power, he says, these shall receive greater damnation or greater judgment. And why is that? Because Jesus knew they were leaders. They were supposed to be God's representatives. They should have known the truth. They should have rejected all the things that they were doing. But yet, what did they do? They rejected it and they led others astray. And God said, no, -uh, I cannot allow that. See, material wealth and power and popularity are not guaranteed signs of God's favor. Did you hear that? Worldly wealth, power, and popularity are not guaranteed signs of God's favor in this life. That's important for us to realize for ourselves, but also for us to realize with others as well. And, and ultimately, that belief is the health and wealth. It's the health and wealth. It's, it's, the, it's the prosperity gospel. But let's think about this. Let's look at Jesus. If Jesus is our, the one we're supposed to follow and mimic and imitate... Look at Jesus' life. He didn't have anything while he was here on this earth. But the let me ask you this question. He, you know, he says, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has what? He didn't have a place to stay. He didn't have his own place. But let me ask you this. Did he have God's favor? Oh, yeah. If anybody ever had the favor of God, it was Jesus Christ. Perfectly sinless, perfectly obedient, did whatever the Father asked 
He had the favor of God, but yet he had zero material wealth. Born in a manger. Buried in a borrowed tomb. Just because we have material wealth does not always, it can mean that, but not always that God's grace or God's favor is upon us. And so the scribes, let's go back to the scribes here. They rejected Jesus' Messiahship, right? That he's, he's the God-man, perfectly God, perfectly man. They rejected that and they were unwilling to submit to the authority of Jesus. And therefore, what did they do? They lived for the here and the now. Rather than giving and being generous, what did they do? They took and they hoarded. They hoarded what they had. And so Mark goes from this negative example. Now we're going to see a little bit more of a positive example. But really, I think in this, even in the positive example, we're going to see further condemnation of this negative example. You'll see what I'm talking about. Let's go to verse 41 as we move through this. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how, how the people cast money into the treasury. These were probably boxes located there in the temple courts. And many that were rich cast in much. Now I love this image because here you are in the temple courts and Jesus finds one of these boxes, these donation boxes, and he, he sits pretty close to it and he has an eyesight. You know, he's in his line of sight. And he just watches people give. <laughs> and that, I just think that's so funny because the thought of us like sitting there staring watching people how much they give. You know, what if we, st- what if we posted somebody back here next to the offering plate? And as you walk by, I, I, that was always, uh, deacons, you guys can uh, test it. That was always kind of the weird thing when you pass a plate. You know, you're, I'd always like pass it and like try to do this right now, you know, not to look, you know. But Jesus, he's standing there and he's looking. And let, just a quick time out. He can look because he's God, amen? <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether he looks directly or not. God knows. And this is another truth. I think this shows us here. God knows what we give. And God knows what we don't give. And not only that, God sees the intention of our heart. And I always got to remember my heart's on the left side. I always want to point over here. God sees the intention of our heart. He knows whether we give or not. It's not whether I know or don't know, or your brother or your sister. Actually, they probably shouldn't know, right? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand gives. But God knows what you give or what you don't give. And verse 41b, and look at what it says here in the second part. And many that were rich cast in, they put in much into these boxes. See, although these rich individuals gave large sums of money, Jesus does not praise them. And why is that? Possibly because they were doing it to be seen by others. We don't know their heart. That's, uh, motivation is so hard to determine. Uh, Maybe they're like the scribes. They wanted to to have them to your wealth for themselves or or see others, let others see them giving. Maybe they didn't give in faith. Maybe their heart wasn't right. Or maybe it's because they gave just a small fraction of what they had. Or possibly they thought that maybe by giving this money they would earn God's favor. Well, we don't know. But, but, But look what comes next. Jesus is still there watching. And then he sees a certain poor widow, verse 42 a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites. She threw in her two cents. (laughs) I think that's a a fun illustration. But she threw in two mites, which was a farthing. Now, a mite was this small copper coin. And in those days, in, in the Jewish currency, this was the smallest of small currency. You couldn't get anything less. For us, it'd be like a penny, right? You, You can't get anything less than a penny for us. You might can on the computer and all this, but, but really, the smallest coin we have is a penny. And we know the worth of a penny today, right? Used to, you could buy a cup, at least something with a penny. What can you buy with a penny today? I don't, I don't know if you can buy anything with a penny, honestly, right? A candy, you can't even buy a small piece of candy. Maybe on the black market you get somebody to open their roll aids or something and give you one for a penny, you know, maybe a tic tac. I'll give you a tic tac, a penny for a tic tac, you know. <laughs> you can't buy anything with it. it. It's so tiny, it's so small. And I think that's the point here. What this woman gave was so small as well. And look at verse 43. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow 
hath cast in more than all they which have cast in the treasure. That's amazing. He watched all these people come with all this rich, all these just huge lumps of some. They drop in. And here comes this, this lady, widow, with two pennies. I mean, pennies were, I, I don't, sometimes I don't even bother to reach over and pick a penny up if I see one. Right? I say, what's a penny? <laughs> you know? But, but he says, this woman that dropped two pennies, she gave more than all the rest. Verse 44. For all they did cast in of their abundance. They gave there for their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. We see this. Not only does she give two pennies, it seems to be that this is all this woman has left. This is it. And, and it, no, no lunch after worship, right? Because, man, she just puts everything in there. No opals, no restaurant, not even going home to get just a piece of bread. Nothing. This is it. She puts it in. And Jesus says here that the poor widow who put in her two pennies put in more than all the rest. And why is that? Because Jesus said, because she gave out of her poverty. And, and for me, as I've tried to just think and pray through, try to understand that this, understand that this week, uh, I realize she had two coins. She could have kept one and put one in, but she didn't. She puts both of them in. And, and I think this shows, I think in this situation, we'll talk more about what, are we, are we supposed to do it this way? Is this a model for us? We'll talk about this in a few minutes. All of her hope was in God. She's like, I don't have anything. Nothing to eat, no hope. But you know what? I have God. I'm, my hope is in God. And she puts it in. It, I think it shows her trust for God to, to, to care for her in this moment. And, and, and I think as we look at giving, I think this example, the two examples, show us that God does not evaluate our giving objectively. Right? God does not evaluate our giving objectively. And what do I mean by that? Just because one person drops in $1,000 and one person drops in one penny. It, it doesn't mean that this person with $1,000 is given more. No, God doesn't do it objectively. Small gifts are not always small gifts in the kingdom of God. Large gifts are not always large gifts. Think about the boy. I always think, come back to this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Think about that boy that gave the, the two sardines and the five tortillas, what I, I would call them. <laughs> they were nothing big. He didn't have much, but he offered. And it's amazing what, when, when that little boy offered just what he had, God took it and multiplied it. And that's what God does, man. He takes what, what we have and he takes and multiplies it for his kingdom and, and for his glory. Never think that whatever you put in, just because... See, we struggle with comparison, Right? We think, oh, so-and-so puts this much in, or they give this kind of gift, and I, only, I can only give this. No. Jesus said, no, it, God doesn't work like that. He, he sees the intent of the heart. And, and someone, I remember, uh, maybe as a preacher, a quote I saw once, and it said, God focuses less on what we give and more on what we keep for ourselves. And that would be a very... We don't think of giving like that. We think of what's the... What's the smallest amount of number that I can give and my conscience will be clear? But that's not biblical. That's not kingdom giving. We don't focus about how much we keep for ourselves. We think, okay, what's, the, what's that line? Draw me the line. I'll give that. My conscience will be eased and I can move on. But we're going to see that kingdom of giving is different. So stay with me move, as we move through this. Jesus measures, in our giving, I believe Jesus measures our sacrifice and our faith, not dollar amounts. Our sacrifice and our faith. Think about this woman, all that she had. She gave sacrificially. I remember being in the labor camps. We would go out and late at night because these late, when we were in the Middle East, there in Abu Dhabi, these laborers would work all day. They're working 60 plus hours a week. And, and we would come in they, late in the night. It's the only time we could meet with them because they're always out working. Hard work and that heat. I mean, it was hot every day. It was either hot or really hot. That was pretty much the weather. And these men come in late. And tired, and, and we go to visit them, wanting to just encourage them, wanting to share the gospel. And they would see us coming, and these guys would send all the mo most of the money they had. They would send home, and they would just keep a little bit to live on. But every time we would come, 
uh, see them, to visit them, we knew as soon as we got there, somebody would run. They'd just go out the door and they'd run. And they'd always come back with a big bottle of Mountain Dew. Which is, which is exactly what we wanted to drink at 10 p.m., amen? <laughs> Sugary and salty snacks and a big thing of Mountain Dew. But it's all they had. I mean, it, they were just so, they're so generous. And there's just that we don't know. To, I mean, we do. There's a sense of hospitality here. But for, in that culture... There's just a great sense of hospitality. I mean, not having much, but yet willing to give. And man, I'd chug that. And you learn, man, you, you leave a little bit in your cup. Because if you drink it all, at first I thought, you know what, I, I'll just down this and, and we'll be done. No, if that cup is empty, they're pouring it. <laughs> and you're like, you're like man, you know, you're keeping it away from them. But they're just like, you know, pouring it. Because they were willing to give. Just that generosity, sacrificial giving, hospitality. So the question here is, I think for all of us this morning, is are we giving sacrificially? And I, I don't mean just to the church, I mean yes to the church, but also in, in other areas of our lives. Are we giving sacrificially? And you could talk about not just money, we can talk about time as well. And our efforts. Are we giving of ourselves? Are we giving sacrificially? And my guess is most Americans, and I would say including us, and I'd say even myself at times, we are not giving sacrificially. And this is, this is convicting. Are we giving sacrificially? Most of us lack our comfort, our homes, our cars, our food, our travels, our hobbies. I could keep going. Clothing. We like them so much or too much that we're not able to give sacrificially. Uh, and that's the kingdom giving that I'm talking about today. And I think Jesus is, is pointing out and shows all throughout the New Testament is sacrificial giving. Like the scribes with their long robes occupying the uppermost rooms and banquets, we like our American comforts uh, quite a bit. Because so often we're far more consumed with this life than the life to come. And I think th- it's, a, it's a perspective. It's a perspective if we think this life is, and this is the life we're focused about, and not focused on the life to come, we will. We will become like the scribes. And sometimes it's gradual. And sometimes we don't even realize it until we're, we kind of got to back up and pull, pull away and look. We, we live for now and not eternity. But here's what we need to realize. It's a change of perspective. C.S. Lewis writes, and he says this. He says, if you aim at heaven, and you'll get earth thrown in. But if you aim at earth, you'll get neither. And I think that's so true. If we aim at heaven, man, if our focus is heaven, storing up treasures in heaven, uh, C.S. Lewis, and I think uh, matches up with the word of God too, is that we'll get earth thrown in. But if we just focus on earth, then we're going to lose heaven and earth. It's just this simple truth. And, and Lu- another quote, quote from Lewis, uh, back to back here. Here's you a, a two for one here. Lewis says, if you read history you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. That's so so true. If we're so focused on this life and not the next, then we're going to live like the scribes. Um. And so how much should we give? Let's talk about this. Let's, let's just talk some application here. How much should we give? Some of you are like, David, I, just give me a number. <laughs> just give me a number. But I'm not going to. And you know why? Because I don't think Jesus gives a number. I don't think the, the early church lived by numbers. Some of you say, well, David, what about the tithe, right? What about the 10%? In the Old Testament, the, the folks under the Old Covenant were required to give 10%. Now, I don't know if I've ever spoken about this openly, uh, but, but here you go. Here's my thoughts on it. I don't believe that we are required to give a tithe now in the New Covenant. Why is that? Because that was a part of the Old Covenant. And if you count the Old Covenant, the 10%, they actually, you add all the thing, different things they had to give, they were giving more than 10%. But you say, Dave, well, why, why not? Why is that? Because we're part of the New Covenant. We're, we're, not, old, we're not following all the Old Covenant, all the Old Testament rules and regulations. You may say, Dave, okay, wait, well then, what are we supposed to do? I think we're called to give generous, generously and, and sacrificially. 
Is, is a 10% a good place to start? Yes. But I think if we stop there, I, don't, I think especially in our American culture and context, we're not living generously or sacrificially. Most of us. I, I, think, I can't speak for everybody. But I think most of us, if we only give 10%, that's not sacrificial giving. I, I, I think that's true. And, and let's look here. Um, look, at, look at the New Testament. The New Testament church, what did they do? They gave generously. They gave sacrificially. If they looked around and they saw somebody in need, you know what they did? I mean, they went and sold a field or they went and sold a house. They went and sold whatever they had to then give money to help those in need. That's what, I mean, the story, we're kind of introduced to Barnabas in, in that way in the book of Acts. He was, he was willing to say, you know what? There's a need in my community. I've got this piece of land. I'm going to go and sell it and come and bring the money to help. Sacrificial, I mean, that's sacrificial giving. And you may say, well, Dave, well, what about this, this, this widow? And I want to make this clarification here. Does this mean that we should take our paychecks and come and drop in the offering plate or go give it to a missionary or whatever and then just pray for the Lord to provide for us the rest of the month? I don't think that's what it's saying. I don't think it's prescribing that. Okay? Because I, I think in this sense, in that sense, the, the widow is not a model for us. And I'll, I'll, sh- I'll show you some reasons why I think that here in a few minutes. But I think we live with wisdom. We act in wisdom. I think if we give our money away and then we're out bumming or begging, I mean, that, that, that's not wise. Right? But I think there's a way that we can give sacrificially and generously, but also with wisdom as well. So look at 2 Corinthians 9 7. Paul writes there and he says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Does God love someone who doesn't give or doesn't give sacrificially? I mean, yes, God loves everybody, but what's he saying? Man, God loves someone who's willing to give. I think as Christians, we should be open handed, not, uh, not unwise with our money, but man, we should be known as a generous people. And sometimes we're not generous, and I've been guilty of this as well. We're not generous because we focus too much on this world. We call to be generous. And whatever you have determined in your heart, you give that and be faithful in that. But, But asking yourself, am I being generous? Am I giving sacrificially? And so we and and why is that to we must remember that everything that we have, the clothing that we have, any home, any food, anything we have is because God gave it to us. And you may say, David, but, but you know, I, I've worked really hard. You know, I, I, I work over 40 hours. I've worked over 40 hours for over 30 or 40 years. You know how hard I worked when I was younger? You know how much overtime I worked? But you know what? You wouldn't have been able to even work. If not for God. You wouldn't have been able to get out of bed in the morning. We wouldn't even exist without God. So you see what I'm saying? All that we have is because of God. And God calls us to be faithful stewards of what he's given us. And to, to give and to live generously and sacrificially. Now let's come back to the widow story. This is why I don't think this is a, this is a prescribed event for all of us. And that we should take our paycheck and just go drop it and give it away. Because I think the story of the widow, and this is what changed my mind, or just blew my mind this week as I studied this. The story of the widow, here's the irony. The story of this widow is that it was not to praise the widow as much as it was to condemn the scribes. You may say, David, what are you talking about here? The widow was giving to the very system who was oppressing her. Right? Right? You remember what we talked about? Look, remember we, back in verse 40? It was the scribes who had taken the widow's home. Now, we don't know if she'd been ta- her home had been taken. You know, she, we don't know if she was one of the widows. But she was given two pennies to a system that was corrupt. She was given two pennies to a system that had take, possibly taken her own home. And so Jesus is saying... He's not as much praising to her as he's condemning the scribes even further. And he's condemning this system. Because see, in those days, the law required for the Jews to care for the widows. 
and the oppressed, the downtrodden. And what are the scribes doing? They're taking their houses. Whew. Talk about some condemnation. That's why Jesus says their judgment will be greater. Their damnation will be greater. Those that have perpetrated and been a part of this evil system, this temple system that has oppressed this widow so much so that she only has two pennies to put in the offering plate. You see, you see when you look at the big picture of this, and this, this conflict between Jesus and these religious leaders, but also the conflict between Jesus and, and the temple system. And Jesus saying, no, it cannot be this way. And church, my prayer is that we would never be a, a, a church that treats the widows and the oppressed like the scribes are doing here, that we would never keep so much money for ourselves that we would be unwilling to give to others. Man, this is challenging. Amen? And this is, this is tough stuff. And we can look at it and say, oh, yes, we would never be like the scribes. But maybe it, I think at times it's easy to be like the scribes. And sometimes it's, it's gradual. So it's an, I think this story is an even greater indictment of this system that this woman was giving to. It was so, and this, this temple system and the religious leaders were so corrupt that Jesus said, no more. It's got to go. And that's a scary thought, and I think that should scare the greed out of each and every one of us. Because look in the next few verses, and this is why we're going into chapter 13, because I think it just kind of all flows together. Look in verse 1. As he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. He's like, ooh, look at this. Oh, it's so magnificent. It's so nice and wonderful. And Jesus said, you know what? You see these great buildings or this great building here? There, there shall be not one left, one stone upon other that shall not be thrown down. She said, this, this corruption, this way these scribes are acting, it cannot continue. And he, not only did he judge it back when he cleanses the temple, but again we see Jesus speaking judgment against this particular system. And a few decades later, 70 AD, the Romans come in and they destroy this temple. Knock the stones down, just as Jesus predicted here. So let's come back to the widow. On one hand, I think she, she had her faith and hope in God, but she was misguided. I think that's the key word. She was misguided by the religious establishment. I think deep down she's given. Uh, she knew she was supposed to. She's given what was determined in her heart. But the question is, where should our hope and faith truly have been placed? In the God-man. The God-man Messiah. That's why we started, first started talking about Jesus as the Messiah. The one who's going to bring this great kingdom. This kingdom of equity and a kingdom of love. And a kingdom of, of people flourishing. See, the Messiah would bring about a kingdom... That was very much unlike the kingdom that the Jews and the scribes and the religious leaders had created. And praise be to God that he has already come. He has planted the seed of that kingdom. And the kingdom of God, even to this day, continues to grow. And we look forward to the day when that Messiah, Jesus Christ, returns to fully establish his kingdom. And I pray until he does that, may we never fall back into a system that Jesus already destroyed and condemned and brought judgment on. May we reflect the kingdom of God here in our day because the one that our hope should have been should have been in the one that was just sitting there watch her put her money in. I just love that image. She's putting, it's like she, she drops her money in, her faith and hope is in God, but, but deep down she's putting into a system when really her hope should have been in the Messiah. But it but it doesn't seem she, she, she hadn't gotten there yet. She hadn't fully understood that. The one who in a few days that was going to die on an old rugged cross for her and for you and for me. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. When, when I think of giving, and actually Cindy alluded to, to, to this this morning as well. And it's amazing how what she said just lines up in the way the Spirit works. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, He had everything in heaven. 
You think you ever seen a really nice? You know, you see these shows, these HGTVs, these really nice homes, and you look at them, man, the back indoor pool and back door. I mean, everything just so nice, land as far as you can see. And you're like, man, that'd be nice. Jesus had it all, far better than that. Although he was rich, yet for our sakes, for your sakes, he came to this earth and became poor took on human flesh, dwelt among us, born in a manger, had nowhere to lay his head. Carpenter's son, he became poor that that you, us, you all, through his poverty, might become rich. Isn't that a beautiful... When we think about giving... We cannot forget about the cross of Jesus Christ and, and the model, what Christ has done for us. He was rich, but yet He gave everything for us. And He came and He dwelt among us. He died and gave His life for us. So in those moments, brothers and sisters, here's one of the most important application points for us today. In those moments of greed or when you're feeling maybe tight-fisted, or, or you're not wanting to sacrificially, be sacrificially generous, my encouragement to you, is to remember the cross of Jesus Christ. Remember the cross. The gospel is at the heart of, of everything we do, even in giving. We wouldn't have anything, especially not our salvation, if not for Jesus. We wouldn't even, be exist, we wouldn't even exist because all things were created by and for and through Jesus Christ. All that we have is because of Jesus Christ. And why would we be tight-fisted when Jesus Christ was not? And he's our our Lord and Savior. He's our model. We follow him. So brethren, my my hope and prayer as we wrap it up here is that we would never be like the scribes. We'd be a church. We'd be individuals. We'd be families that would never be like the scribes in this story. Living for themselves. Living for today. Not living for eternity. Exploiting the poor. Exploiting the oppressed. Not willing to reach out. Not willing to help them. And I pray, just as I said earlier, I pray that this passage would scare the the greed right out of us. And instead, I pray... That we would give. We'd be a people who, who live and give generously and sacrificially. We give out of pure hearts and we give abundantly uh, to those around us, to those in need, uh, to one another as well. May the Lord help us in that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that... Uh, this is a topic that's difficult for, for many of us. Something that we, if we haven't, if we don't struggle with now, God, we have in the past. And I think that's the, the difficult thing about greed and materialism is, is God, it just kind of sneaks up on us. And we sometimes think that we don't struggle with it when we actually do. That's the, the deception of the enemy. So I pray that you reveal that to us, God. I pray that you would empower us, you would help us. To, to live and to give generously and sacrificially as we keep our eyes fixed and focused on the cross and your son Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. And God, we love you, we praise you. In your son's name we pray, amen. We're going to have a song of invitation. If you're here this morning, you may say, David, you know what? I never experienced the salvation that Christ offers You can do that today. Put your faith and trust in Him. Repent and turn from your sin. And you will become rich. Not Maybe not materially rich, but rich with spiritual blessings. God's Word says that we've been been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Nothing more you could want or ever lack for with Jesus Christ. And also, if you're here, you may say, David, I'm already a follower of Jesus Christ. Ask yourself truly, do I live a generous, a sacrificially generous lifestyle? Or do I need to make some changes? And, and again, this is not to, to, to boost the, the, the church offer giving, but to, uh, my greater concern is for your souls and that you're giving and living generously. Not allowing greed or materialism or money to destroy you on the inside or to keep you out of eternity. As we stand and sing what number? 194, have thine own way, Lord. Let's stand and sing 194. I'll be up front if you need prayer, need someone to talk to.
great question for us to ask often. Is God having his way in my life? If not, confess it, repent, and make the changes that you need to make. your pastor is that God would have his way in every area of your life and that discipleship is a holistic uh, process and it's, it, it affects every part of our lives and giving is a part of that and we can't truly be who Christ wants us to be if we're not giving faithfully and, and I'm not just talking about money as well I think of our time that honestly sometimes that's even harder for us to give is our time than even our money if we're honest some of us it is because, man, we live busy lives. Uh, so are you, are you the person that's giving to God the way that you should? And one of the, those ways that you can give to God of your time is today at 3 o'clock. I'm going to be going door to door. You may say, Dave, I don't know, two hours to go knock on strangers' door. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a fun afternoon. But God has called us to be faithful and to share the gospel. He's called us to go, to make disciples. And, and we have an opportunity to drop these bags and talk to people who may never interact with someone, may never go into a church, may never interact with someone who, who's a follower of Jesus Christ. That's the day and time we live in. So I encourage you to come 3 o'clock. We'll meet over in the Ed Building, head out from there. Also, don't forget some of the ladies or men as well. Uh, stick around, just talk about So we've got our, our heads together for next week's cookout, just the food and, and things like that. So I'm going to ask uh, Jason Vaughn in the back, I'm going to ask him to, to close us in prayer. Amen. You're dismissed. Go and be the church. Okay.